From the Mount Sinai Health System in New York City, this is Road to Resilience, a podcast about facing adversity. I'm John Earl. And they said, they're like, has anyone ever told you that it is okay to be upset that something happened and that you don't have to, your first instinct doesn't have to be, how do I make this into something positive? They were like, you process trauma and events like a PR person. My guest today is figure skater Gracie Gold. She's a two-time national champion and an Olympic bronze medalist. Gracie first came onto my radar at the 2014 Winter Games in Sochi. I was there, working as a country expert for an American broadcaster. Part of my job was to teach our announcers to pronounce Russian names. The hardest was Zinitula Bilidinov, the Russian hockey coach. I'm not even sure I'm saying that one right, to be honest. Anyways, I worked the night shift, and I'd watch hours and hours and hours of sports until my eyes glazed over. But when Gracie Gold stepped onto the ice, I think the entire world sat up straight. She was precise, she was powerful, she was elegant, she was perfect. But like for so many Olympians, perfection came at a very high price. After the games, depression and an eating disorder forced Gracie to take a break from skating. She went to rehab, and then, using new coping skills, she fought her way back. Today, she has her sights on the next Winter Games. This summer, she appeared in a new documentary about mental health and Olympic athletes called The Weight of Gold. She spoke to me earlier this month from her home outside Philadelphia. Gracie Gold, welcome to Road to Resilience. Thank you for having me. You've been figure skating since you were eight years old. Do you remember the moment when you fell in love with it? It was instant. It was the first time that I got on that public session at the birthday party where I started skating. It was an immediate love. And it was unlike any other sport I had come across. And yeah, on the way out the door, I grabbed that flyer for the Learn to Skate program and I had my mom sign me up. What was it about skating? What grabbed you? It was the feeling of gliding, and it was that constant movement. I was, like, amazed with how, especially once you build up speed, that you can be totally still and you're still flying. There's no friction. It's just you, skates, blades, ice, like the feeling of wind. It was... The closest I had experienced would be swimming, like that moment when you first dive into the water and right before you break the surface. That's kind of what skating feels like all the time. How soon after that first time on the ice were you competing? I mean, within a year, for sure. Like probably maybe that next summer, I was at least doing some very small, very low level, obviously, um, competitions. I guess you could just say it snowballed. (laughs) Hmm. You've talked about figure skating as having gone from a hobby to a job to an obsession. When did it become unhealthy? It is a tricky question to answer, and I've gone back and forth on it because there is some level to compete at the Olympics, like to be that good and well-trained at something. It requires some extreme behavior, like your life will be unbalanced because you are literally doing the most. And it was really in like the summer of 2016 um, is when it slowly started to get dark, but it was really not skating. You know, it was all the things around skating. And it was the way that I handled the trials and tribulations of both life and skating. I handled those poorly. So what were some of the trials and tribulations that were hard for you to manage? So in skating, just as any other sport, there are ups and downs, um, injuries, coaching changes. And then the biggest one, of course, is not doing well at competitions. That's like kind of goes without saying that that you will come across that. And I did um, the 2016 World Championships was one of the most traumatic things that had happened to me up to that point. And from the outside, that never made any sense to anybody because I was fourth. I was fourth in the world. Um, But I was fourth in the world again. I was fourth at the Olympics. And then I think I was fourth at Worlds like three times in a row or something, at least two times in a row. It was, which is the, obviously you went back to the drawing board. You tried to do all these things better, to be a better athlete, to be a better competitor. And then you still literally ended up with the same. Is it correct to think that 
if you are skating and skating is your life, failure at skating is a failure as a human being. It's just crushing. Is that how it was? Yeah, on so many levels, that fear of failure, the fear of letting people down, yourself down. But yeah, you devote your life to something, skating. And then it doesn't go well. It's like you're unsuccessful at it. It's like, for what? And yeah, then therefore you are a failure. Like your life's work is a failure. The sensation of letting all of these people down, that sucks, letting your country down. To put it lightly, I would say that's a bummer. Um, But it was, like I said, all of the things around the actual skating that made that moment very traumatic. Gracie said there was personal stuff going on in her life, which combined with the feeling that her career, her everything, was stalling, drove her depression. But even as she unraveled, she kept training. Elite athletes are nothing if not persistent. It's part of what makes them great but it can be a shallow resilience, hiding problems under the surface. Right, as an elite athlete, you're trained to power through. Correct, like just forge ahead, persevere, be resilient. Like I will just keep going in a way that is admirable until it's destructive. So when it came to like my life burning down essentially in front of me, I just focused on what I could control, which is like the physical condition I was in. So things like eating disorders flourish in chaotic environments where, and it's like the only thing that you can control. That's like a recipe for disaster. But like my ED was psyched about it. So... uh, Who was psyched about it? Oh, my ED, my eating disorder. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) (laughs) um yeah she was psyched um but yeah I didn't yeah so yeah like you said I just kept going forward and I just figured something just something would give three years after the Olympics she hit rock bottom it was winter in Michigan dark and cold Gracie could barely leave the house she'd stay up for days then sleep for 24 hours She binge ate and covered the mirrors to hide her changing reflection. Days when she brushed her hair and teeth. Those were good days. She was just 21 years old. You were having suicidal thoughts? I was, so I don't really identify with being like actively suicidal. Like I didn't have any plans or anything like that, but I was aware that, I was like, you know what would solve all of these problems is if I wasn't here anymore. And there was, I had some sort of morbid curiosity and like just seeing like how bad things could get or just like where, or just like what would be the end of this story. When Gracie did finally open up to somebody, their advice made her feel even more alone. And I did have this heart to heart with this person where I actually really told this person everything that was wrong. And she told me, she was like, okay, well, here's a quote. If you want to be happy, be happy. That was so upsetting because I no longer felt like telling someone what was actually wrong because what that told me is even someone who saw me every day didn't get it or I was being just dramatic. Like, so I felt so unseen by that, that I no longer wanted to open up. Fortunately, that summer, Gracie tried again. And this time, the response was exactly what she needed. They were like, oh my God, this is some really heavy trauma. And they were like, we recommend, they didn't say we recommend, they said, we would like to help you get help, which is different because it's really easy to look at someone and be like, they're insane and they should do something about it. Then to actually take that person's hand and be like, you are not living your life the way that you want to or that you could and that there are enough things here that are preventing you from being your best self and your happiest self. And we would like to help you uh, find your feet again. And we would like to walk with you as we find someone who's trained to get you through this. It was that like offering of the hand and like sitting with me in the dark as we like found our way. It simultaneously made me feel not alone I felt like somebody cared. I felt validated. 
And I felt for the first time in a long time, maybe the most powerful emotion of all those was hope. I felt hope and I felt like I could trust somebody and it was the beginning of everything. Gracie went to rehab. There, her skating bubble burst. It was this wild experience that it was the first time I'd seen life outside of a rink. And it was kind of beautiful and extraordinary and like messed up. And for example, my first day, I get in really late at night and then I wake up in the morning. I'm like kind of looking for the bathroom. My roommate busts open the door. She is totally naked. And she was like, oh, hey, girl, what's up? It's like, hi. Um, like, grabs her clothes and puts them on. And she's like, um, oh, she like holds out like a pack of cigarettes. And she's like, I'm going to go for a smoke. Do you want one? I was like, what is happening? At rehab, she encountered the idea of toxic positivity. It's when there's such an emphasis on always being so positive that there's no space for sadness or anger or grief. For Gracie, it was a revelation. Toxic positivity is something that I grew up around and I was just so sick of people telling me to just look on the bright side all the time. Like, or like, it could be worse. Um, I used to get that all the time. Or like, you're Gracie Gold. What do you have to complain about? But yeah, that toxic positivity was the first time that like an adult, like, like my therapist or a psychiatrist, like people that were like trained to call you on, you know, your BS. And they said, they're like, has anyone ever told you that it is okay to be upset that something happened and that you don't have to, your first instinct doesn't have to be, how do I make this into something positive? And they were like, they were like, you process trauma and events like a PR person. <laughs> Literally, they're like, you just, it's like you're already writing the narrative on how this is going to be when they're like, you can just say like, that sucks. Like this hurt me. Like this changed me as a person. Could be better or for worse, but like the fact that it like changed you is like there are moments like that. Um, and that was extraordinary to me. And I never encountered it in 21 years, 22 years of being alive. You know, we on the podcast, we talk a lot about, you know, reframing thoughts and and being optimistic. And I hope we strike the right balance between being real and, and as you said, like validating that some experiences suck. They're just painful. Um, but even like the way that you framed, like you acknowledged that it was painful. And then it's like that moment of then how do you process that pain? so that it doesn't yet destroy you and that it doesn't... Because you meet people that they just stay, like, stuck in that moment of pain where they never moved on in their entire life to the point where it's almost... They have that personality of, like... Their personality is their suffering, Mm -hmm. which is like a shame and it also makes them unbearable to be around. Um... But a lot of, like, the toxic positivity, like, misses that moment of this is painful and then accepting that there's a lot of potential for it to change. Can you share with us some of the coping strategies that you've learned in the last few years that have been really effective for you? I found, um, I I don't want to say, like, productive art therapy, but as far as like, I really like interior design and I really like DIY projects. So I'm like, Bob, the the builder kind of vibes, but that has been like a really good outlet. And then that feeling of accomplishing a task, even though, you know, that seems really childish and simple, it releases like feel good chemicals in our brain, no matter how simple it is. And then exercise has always been a big one. And it's also one of the very few outlets and coping mechanisms that I have for when I'm feeling angry. I didn't understand like how to handle my anger for a really long time because I just, so I just suppressed it. I just like pushed it 
down further and further. But exercise, and I discovered it like more via like weight loss. Um, I'm sorry, weight lifting. Because with I was more of like a cardio person. And if you're mad on the elliptical, it's just not the right vibe. Um, like you can't elliptical out your anger. Like it's not really the right feeling for that, right? That's, uh, that's ridiculous. And I was never one where it's like hot yoga, like that didn't work for me as far as anger because anger is uh, a powerful emotion and that it's not a bad one. It has some gifts. And one of its main gifts is um, strength and power. So if I'm feeling angry and I'm having that rush of strength and power, I hit the gym. I get some weight on my back. I get some like under some heavy weight. And I found that to be a very healthy, non-destructive coping mechanism. Right. You've worked your way back to competing at the elite level. And I know you've had a mantra through this period, trust the process. What does that mean to you? Trust the process. So I skate in Aston, Pennsylvania, and the largest big city is like Philly. So Philly loves their sports. And I've recently, like over the past like two years, like fallen in love with basketball. And um, the 76ers, I mean, they're like brand slogan. That's why I'm always like, I didn't make this up, is trust the process. And that's kind of how it started. And then like two of my coaches are Eastern European and it like blew their minds. They were like, yeah, like trust the process, trust the work that we're doing. We kind of did like trust the process. And then whoever, like I say it to like one of my coaches, then they say like work the process back or vice versa. But yeah, it's just trusting that process, working that process and just trusting yourself as well that the process that you have like set up is a good one and the right one for you. You are one of the few athletes who appear in the film who's still training for the Olympics. What's driving you, first of all, and how is it different than last time? Well, it's different than like last time, so to speak, because I would really pretty much done everything that you could do in skating, right? Like Olympic medal, check, national champion. Like, you know, we have checked a lot of boxes. And so this time it's not like, this feeling of like, I have to, or I'm a failure. It's not like the fear of failure driving me or the fear of like letting other people down, but it's more in that pursuit of excellence. And then following my love of the sports to the highest place where you can do it. And like the biggest stage for skating. I understand you teach skating as well. Yeah. Um, And I'm sure you've had students come up to you and say, you know, Gracie, I want to be in the Olympics someday. What advice do you give them? I talk a lot, like, always about finding your why and making sure that you have an answer, that you have intentions, especially when it comes to the sport. Like, why am I training today? A lot of people are like, what am I doing today? But typically, you kind of know what you're doing that day. But, like, trying to find the why behind it is, at least in my opinion— more impactful and especially for me like helps with motivation where it's like what do I have to do today Ugh, laundry as opposed to why after this call am I going to do my laundry so instead of just saying uh I'm gonna say um because you need to have clean skating clothes for tomorrow so suddenly there's like an important thing here and So when it comes to skating, that's like what I tell the kids. I'm like, why are you, why are we having this lesson right now? Like, what are we, why are you at this seminar? Like, why are you pursuing the Olympics? Grace, the last question I want to ask you is, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave listeners with? Um, I found that trauma and unfortunate things, like these will happen to anybody. There'll be traumatic events that almost kill you um, emotionally or in some cases, I'm sure physically. So acknowledge that pain and 
let it change you for the better because it can. Um, And that oftentimes happiness is closer than you think. A long evening spent with really good people that you can be real with and like real people can maybe not like change your whole life, but it, it is very, very healing. And that no matter how terrible your life is going, there's, I've done a lot of healing in those moments. Gracie Gold, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. That's all for this episode of Road to Resilience. If you enjoyed the conversation, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and tell a friend about us. Thanks. The film about Olympians and mental health is called The Weight of Gold. It features Michael Phelps and Lolo Jones and Apollo Ono. It's really good. It's streaming on HBO. Trust me, you'll never look at the Olympics the same way again. Thanks again to Gracie and her team for making this episode happen. Road to Resilience is a production of the Mount Sinai Health System in New York City. It's made by Katie Ullman, Nikki Hudson, and me, John Earl. Our executive producer is Lucia Lee. From all of us here, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.